here before, um, I had a friend that worked here and she would always tell me about the wonderful initiatives that uh, Skills for Change took charge of. And I'm really delighted that I'm able to be a guest speaker here tonight. So before I start, um, before I tell you a little bit about myself, I want to know about the crowd. Can people raise their hand and tell me who's looking for a job right now? Okay. <laughs> and how many of you people who are not looking for a job believe that you're underemployed? Okay. All right. Okay, good. I wanted to get an assessment of, you know, where the crowd stands. So, a bit about myself. Uh, I, you know a bit about my uh, work background, but in order to put it in context, uh, my name is Yusra Siddiqui. I'm originally from Pakistan. So I immigrated to Canada when I was three. So by most people's standards, I'm not really much of an immigrant. But um, I immigrated to Montreal in the 70s, in the early 70s, so that ages me, um, <laughs> when I uh, came to Canada with my immigrant parents from Pakistan. I didn't speak a word of English, I didn't speak a word of French, and the week after I arrived, I was put into bilingual school. But at three, you're a sponge, and you learn. You learn your languages, and you learn them faultlessly without accent. It wasn't so great for my then 37-year-old father or my early 30-year-old mother, who then had to not only improve on their English skills, but then also learn French. So you can imagine um, Pakistani immigrants in the 70s, you know, speaking French and trying to get their first jobs in Canada and being told, but where's your Canadian experience? And so the challenges that many uh, new immigrants face today are the same challenges that new immigrants faced 40 years ago. And it's actually a very poor reflection on our society that we haven't progressed that far in improving these Canadian cultural norms and practices in this area. So I grew up in a typical immigrant household. You know, we had the one bedroom basement suite and I slept on the sofa bed in the living room. And uh, my mother was a physician in Pakistan, my father an accountant. And my mother was tenacious and determined that she was going to get her foreign medical degree recognized and be requalified as a physician. It took her about 15 years where all she did was write exams, move around, try and get residency programs. And all I remember of my childhood of my mother was studying. She was just studying, studying, studying for God knows what exam that time. Mm -hmm. But that really taught me important values. Taught me how important it was going to be for me to study hard. And, uh, and I saw that so much of it had to do with luck too because my mother's friends were also studying for the residency exams and trying to get uh, medical licensing equivalency. And they were just as bright as my mother. My mother succeeded, but her, some of her friends didn't. And uh, I think that really made me realize that you're only one or step, two steps away from success and so much of it has to do with luck and whenever we accomplish anything, we should be so grateful and we should never forget about the people who didn't get those lucky breaks and we do owe it to all the people around us to try and make things easier for them um, because so much of what we get is based on luck. The luck of where you were born, the luck of your economic circumstances, the luck of your one parent getting a great opportunity or not. So I think I was raised with those values, um, seeing them from my immigrant parents and seeing them have to deal with where's your Canadian experience or who cares about Indian and Pakistani education and you speak with a funny accent therefore you can't be intelligent and oh, don't think you're ever going to get that far when you're an immigrant in this society. I heard it all, I lived through it all. Um, so when I went to uh, university at McGill, I thought, okay, what do I want to do? And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. All I know is I didn't want to go and get a job. I just thought, oh, what can I do to not get a job? So I thought, let's go to law school. So that'll extend my education beyond my first degree. So then I went to law school. And then I started thinking, now, what do I want to do? And, uh, and I thought, well, what am I interested in? I was always interested in causes. If there was a cause, I was part of it. Any cause I could get into at McGill, I was part of. And, uh, and, like, and they were usually cultural causes, but not my own culture. 
So there were weeks that I thought I was Lebanese, other weeks I thought I was Sudanese, other weeks I thought I was Somali, depending on what the crisis was in the world. And I would permanently protest either outside the U.S. consulate or one of the other First World Nation consulates. And so I became involved with immigrant causes and refugee causes because, you know, these people came from these displaced countries that I wish I had come from, so I had some authority for these protests that I would participate in. And uh, when I got to law school, I thought, you know, there's all these great refugee causes and immigrant causes that I wanted to get involved in from a legal perspective. But our law school didn't offer any immigration clinics focused on refugee issues. They had those focused on um, family law rights, landlord tenant, and just people who lived in certain neighborhoods. But nothing unique to refugee and immigrant issues, and more importantly, no one with the sensitivity and the training required to deal with the special cultural circumstances when working with people from different countries. So I decided I'm going to start a refugee law clinic. Mm -hmm. So I started a refugee law clinic, got the funding, um, and no one ever had ever thought about it. Everybody thought, of what a great idea, but nobody thought about it. So I put the idea there, got a lot of students to volunteer, and we started the uh, refugee and immigration law clinic. Then I graduated from law school and I decided, okay, I have to do articling, which is a precursor to getting your license to be a lawyer. And uh, by this time I decided I really like immigration law, but I wanted to make sure that I had a really broad-based understanding of the law. So I worked at a big corporate commercial firm in downtown Toronto, but I tried to do as much immigration law as possible. And during that one year, I realized, wow, I really love immigration law and I really hate corporate commercial law. <laughs> so when I became a lawyer then, I decided, okay, I'm going to do an immigrant. I'm going to practice immigration law, and I started working with Barbara Jackman. Some of you may have heard of her. She's a leading refugee lawyer. I adore her to this day, and I started doing nothing but refugee law, and I loved it. I loved it with all my heart, but I was crying all the time. I was crying all the time because I either couldn't get the real, genuine refugees in, and I felt so bad that I was failing them as a lawyer, or I got in a lot of people who used lies to get in, and I cried all the time because I felt like I was failing my country, assisting people uh, promote inappropriate applications. And then I was also crying for me because I was so poor and I never knew how to charge anyone for money, so I was poorer than most of my clients. So I thought, how do I do this without crying all the time? So I thought, okay, let's become an immigration lawyer focused on companies and focused on people who have jobs and want to come to Canada and bring their great skills to this country. So that's how I moved into the world of corporate immigration. And so now I've been an immigration lawyer for 18 years. So, um, and it sounds like really old, and I don't feel like I'm that old, but 18 years practicing law is like pretty significant. What always surprises me though are some of these statistics that I have to confront myself with. One, I've been practicing law for 18 years, but two, and a bit more shocking to me is that I am the most senior female partner on Bay Street, at a Bay Street law firm, that's a Muslim woman. I was the first one. And you think, wow, why would I be the first one? I'm, I'm 43. I, I, you don't think you're a pioneer at 43. But then when you think about the historical immigration patterns, when did the majority of individuals come to Canada? When did they have that big migration curve? From my history, it was all around Expo 67 and thereafter. People came en masse, mid-60s, late 60s. And what's unique about law, and I think it's also true of journalism, law and journalism are among the two professions where you really have to feel so comfortable and one with the culture to feel comfortable to practice in that area. I think that foreign trained engineers, foreign trained doctors, foreign trained accountants, although they come to this country and they may find hard, it hard for uh, accreditation and recognition, they can still become successful in those professions in this country. Law and journalism, you almost feel like you have to have local street cred, sound like everyone else, grow up in this culture, understand the societal norms and the cultural practices to be not only effective in that profession, but to command that respect that's required to be effective in that profession. So the first um, group of either Canadian-born kids of immigrants 
or first generation immigrants that grew up here really was late 60s, early 70s, my generation. And the majority of the Muslim immigrants that weren't already in Alberta, um, that were of Lebanese background, came from India, Pakistan, and all these other Muslim countries, late 60s, early 70s. So then when I think of it that way, then okay, mathematically, yeah, I guess I would be among that first batch. But then I look and think, okay, fine, I'm the most senior female Muslim partner on Bay Street at a Bay Street law firm. But at the Muggies event that you attended, my counterpart, who's a partner at a management consulting firm, she's my age too, and she's the first and she's the only. My counterpart at an accounting firm, who's a partner, is my age. We're all part of that first batch. And then after us, there aren't that many more. There's very few. So we have to look at, okay, why is, are we the first batch? And then why aren't there that many of us? And that's what I focus on more. Why aren't there more of us? Why don't people stay in the professions that we've selected? And how do we get more young people to get into the profession and want to stay in that profession? And so I've been um, really involved in trying to figure a lot of these things out. And, and so the strategies that I've come up with or the, the information that we've discovered through that is very consistent with the report that I read. Thank you very much for forwarding me. Um, in, that, uh, in that report, they cite a bunch of factors that contribute to women, especially immigrant women, being able to get into the workplace, be able to be valued in the workplace, be successful in the workplace, and then not leave the workplace. Uh, in my profession, the biggest struggle we have in law firms in Canada, especially the big law firms, is not so much women entering the profession, but women leaving the profession because they're like, okay, I can work 80 hours a week when I'm 27 years old and I have no spouse and children, but the day I have children, I can't do 80 hours a week. And by the time you hit 40, nobody wants to do 80 hours a week. So what have we done to address those situations? And there's a lot of studies that have been conducted in Toronto, uh, in Canada about that by the consulting firms. And it's very strategic to look at the rationales that they've found because it really transfers over to the Im immigrant women group. What I want to basically start out with saying in terms of, hmm, what's my advice? Why do I think certain people are more successful than others? Um, there's, there's a bunch of things, but what everyone has to know is that being as good as, for lack of any other word, a white-born Canadian man is not good enough. I don't think it's good enough to be as good as him. I don't think it's good enough to be twice as good as him. The white-born Canadian woman has to be twice as good as the white-born Canadian man. We immigrant women have to be three times as good. Or four. Or four. At least three. You have to be at least three times as good. Because you're dealing with that many more barriers that you have to overcome. You're not a white man where you command respect as soon as you enter a room and you have the name John Smith. I remember I had to go to this business meeting in uh, Johannesburg the first time and I had to go to like the center of this company that developed apartheid, basically, and I happened to be their Canadian lawyer. And I had to go meet with all the AFRICON um, board of directors. And I'm five foot three. I walk into a room, everyone's a white man who supported apartheid, and the next shortest person after me was six foot eight. I walk in, they look past me, they're looking for their Canadian lawyer because they know their Canadian lawyer is coming. Mm -hmm. And then they see a little brown girl. <laughs> and then they're like, Where's our Canadian lawyer? I'm like, hi, I'm your Canadian lawyer. <laughs> You're our Canadian lawyer? And I knew exactly what they were thinking. It was hard. I have never been treated so poorly ever in my life for those first two hours. But by the end of that day, we were the best of friends. And they are now my most loyal client. And when I switched law firms, they were the first one to say, where do we sign to follow you? So I always think of that day as, wow, yeah, they did not treat me as an equal white man when I walked into that room. And I think if I were a white woman walking into the room, they would have thought, ugh, a woman, but, you know, white, she, she's smart. 
But when they saw that brown woman walk into the room, they didn't know what to expect. They, they're mm -hmm. like, wow, I didn't think we were so third tier in Canada. But, um, but this is all just to say that some of this, the advice that I'm about to give comes with a lot of funny stories, a lot of sad stories, but hopefully stories that um, give some credibility to why I give this advice. The first thing is <clears throat> have some networks. You have to have support networks. Support networks are key, and it all ties in with leadership, <coughs> mentoring, and networks. If you don't have a network, you have to create a network. In my profession, there is an old boys network. It is a strong network, and that network starts from the time they all go to the same private schools in downtown Toronto, then they all go to university together. They're all the best of buddies. They don't mean ill by it. But when you've gone to school together for 20 years, and played hockey together for 10 years, and you marry each other's cousin and girlfriends and whatever, <laughs> you build this network whether you want to or not. So then when it comes to, we need a job, who are we going to recommend? I know Joe. Joe's a great guy. I've known him since we lived in Leaside together since we were six. That's the old boys network. When an Alia or a Yasmin or um, a Yustra comes in, she doesn't have that old boys network. That doesn't mean that she doesn't have a network, though. You have to build a network. And you want to build a network that ideally will help you. There's nothing worse than coming to a country and then being surrounded by people who will not help you get that job that you're looking for. So when I started here, being from Montreal, um, never having even been to Toronto and now working here with the funny sounding name, being from the least popular religion out there, I thought, what am I going to do to build my uh, support network? And I just needed friends. I needed somebody to whine and complain with. Uh, so we started, uh, four of us, the Canadian Muslim Lawyers Association. It was started as a dinner party club, just so we could all be friends and so we could all commiserate together. No one knew September 11th was going to happen at that point. <laughs> then, and so we became this great dinner party club. We were all there for each other as support. We whine and complain. We tell each other about opportunities. I say, I don't know how to do this type of contract. People send me an email. Here's a precedent. There were five of us, and I was among the most senior. Then September 11th happened. We have this nice sounding name, the Canadian Muslim Lawyers Association. All of a sudden, we start getting calls from the mosques and from CSIS and RCMP and all these agencies saying, you're the Canadian Muslim Lawyers Association, we need to meet with you. We need your help. You need to deal with your people who are in jail. And we're like, oh my god, we're like corporate lawyers, immigration lawyers, family lawyers, landlord, tenant lawyers. We didn't know any of this stuff. So we had to learn fast. So what did our network do? We reached out to other networks and we were completely humble in our complete lack of knowledge. We reached out to associations that we thought that could be sympathetic. We reached out to anyone with an ear saying, hi, we need help, educate us. We don't know anything about civil liberties. We don't know anything about security certificates, but we have to help our community. Because at the end of the day, it wasn't just a dinner party club. We did feel some connection to our community. We are proud of where we came from. So, um, shockingly, and to this day, I have all the gratitude and respect for them, it was the BC Civil Liberties Association that came out in our support that said, hi, we have a lot of knowledge that we can share with you, and here's all of our precedents. And why was it this organization? Because they were led by members of the gay and lesbian community. And these individuals had fought charter rights on these very points that we were now going to fight charter rights protection on. Whether it's religion or gender and orientation, it's the same charter. So these people who know that my religion had nothing positive to say about this group reached out to us and said, look, we're not going to judge you. You know we, need, we know you need your help. We're going to help you. And then a few other associations did that too. We networked with the other networks. We got help. We actually became then a real association. Before I know it, I'm doing security hearings. I spoke in front of Parliament. I spoke in front of Senate, all because I wanted a dinner party club. But it became good. Now we speak at Moss. But it grew to this in enormous association that's now 250 strong Muslims across the country that sit there and do outreach programs and events to the community and is there for any community. 
not just the Muslim community, any community that needs our help, we're there to help because all the other communities helped us. When we needed help, we remember that, we're there to help. That's the creation of a network. A smaller way to create a network is if you're looking for a job and you're a nurse and you're um, from El Salvador, create a network with other nurses. It doesn't help to create a network with other people from El Salvador who are engineers. And that's the, the knee-jerk reaction that people have. Let's go with our cultural community as opposed to let's go with our goal. Our goal is to be an engineer or our goal is to be a nurse in Canada. Seek networks, mentors, friends, anyone. Piggyback on the success of the person who you want to be at the end of the day. There's, it's wonderful to hang out with your ethnic community, but do not use your ethnic community to get you to that goal um, in the end, unless, of course, your ethnic community coincidentally happens to uh, deal with that goal, too. That's one of the biggest problems I see in my own community, being Pakistani. I see people um, unduly sticking around in their community because it's safe. And safe is good, but you can't just rely on safe. You have to really go out there. So, um, I always say the easiest way to create a network is just find one person. One person who has the job or the lifestyle or the goal that you want. And call them up and say, you know what? You're a nurse in Canada. I'm a foreign trained nurse. Can you help me? I don't need a lot of your time. I just need like maybe an hour to be able to call you or I need you to review my resume. I need you to make some calls for me. I need you to tell me where to start. That is actually the best way to start your network. And ask them, can you introduce me to other people? What else can, uh, do you know any organizations I can join? That's how we did it. I think that's a really great strategy to, uh, to affect change. The other thing that I always ask people to do is people come in to me and say, oh, this whole cultural divide of fitting in. Like, we're not Canadian. I, from, from my background, I always get the, we don't drink alcohol, haram, 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 we can't go to a bar. We can't go and socialize with people in a bar because we don't drink alcohol. And I respect that. That's all good. You have to know where you're going to draw your own personal line. And you have to respect, and this is what I hate about my group, and I'm sure it's in every cultural group because we all think our cultural backgrounds are unique and none of them are. We all have the same baggages. We all have people who attack your own community. Then you have people who help your own community. You have the people who have the biggest obstacles within their own community. It's all the same communities. It's just different names of communities. But in our community, people think that there's this black and light, white line of these are the things you can do, these are the things you can't do, these are the socially acceptable norms, and these are the socially unacceptable norms. Nonsense. Back in our home country, none, nobody had a similar culture. Back in our home countries, everybody did everything their own way. So why would you do it all the same way here? There's no same way. Everybody does things their own way. You have to learn what you're comfortable with and draw your line. And, be str and, and it takes guts to draw your line. Like me, I'm outspoken. I'm not shy. I was raised here. But when I first started telling people, I don't mind if people drink. Heck, I drink. Oh my god, that was like the hardest thing for me to have to say face because I felt like I was like, you know, being a bad Muslim and a bad Pakistani and a bad everything. So I can understand how hard it would be for some people to overcome some cultural norms and societal norms. But you have to. You have to figure out what are you comfortable with. Figure out your own line and draw that line. And once you have that line drawn, then you decide what it is you can and can't do. My friends who cover their hair and don't drink, some of them are still willing to go to that bar and attend a social event because they're like, if I'm not drinking, doesn't matter to me. Other people are like, no, I don't want to go to a bar. And that's fine. If that's your line, that's your line. And then other people are like, oh, yeah, let's just conform. Let's just fit in and lose whatever culture we came with or adapt our culture, whatever. You can't judge those people either. That's their line. Everybody has to just respect that people have different lines and there's no selling out, selling in, being true to something. You know what, we're here to all have a good life individually and you shouldn't care what other people do with their lives. We should all just worry about our own lives. Um, so that's one thing. Figure out where your line is. And once you figure out your line, then it's much easier to decide what it is you're willing to do. But in order to determine what you're willing to do, you have to know the Canadian culture. 
One of the biggest obstacles I always have as an immigration lawyer is I see these lovely, lovely, lovely people, and I deal with them, but <clears throat> stereotypes exist for a reason. I know that when I deal with my clients from Iran, they're going to be a certain way, or certain practices are going to be a certain way. When I deal with my clients from Brazil, oh my God, they're going to be like the most delightful, fun, huggy, kissy people, and you know, they, they're just... Brazilian culture is just so fantastic, and not all Brazilians are, but the culture comes with a certain set of traits that you see. And, and um, a lot of my uh, clients that come from countries where there was extreme hardship, they had to fight for every single thing they got. It also results in certain cultural patterns, because that's surviving. Like, they had to have those characteristics in order to survive. So you have these people with all these different cultural patterns who come to Canada, and they are just being themselves here. And then they wonder, oh my God, why did somebody get offended? Why didn't I get that job? Why didn't I succeed in this job? It's because those cultural practices that worked in those countries don't necessarily work here. And one of the biggest problems is that people don't even know what the cultural practices are here. I think it's really important to, to educate yourself in what are the cultural practices in your city, in your profession, or the occupation in which you want to be. So that you know, this is what the cultural practices are here. I can choose to do them or not, but at least it's an informed choice. There's nothing worse than people just not knowing what they did wrong, not knowing what didn't work. So I always say, inform yourself, know where you draw your line culturally, know what the cultural practices are of the majority, so you can decide where you're going to draw the line. And then appreciate that you will have obstacles. You will have obstacles with Canadian experience. Why don't you have Canadian experience? And then you have to say, how will I ever get Canadian experience if people don't give me the chance to get Canadian experience? There's always the education. How do you get foreign recognition of these degrees? And how do you get Canadian employers to respect this foreign education? There are dozens of universities throughout the world that are leagues better than Canadian universities. So many um, of the universities in what's considered the developing world have much higher standards than any Canadian university has, but the Canadian employers don't know that. How do you persuade them? That's a huge challenge. And then, of course, there's the entire language. If you speak with an accent, there's still those unsophisticated employers who think you can't be as smart if you speak with an accent or if you make an occasional grammar problem. When they're unilingual anglophones and they can barely speak English properly, and then these wonderful immigrants speak like four or five languages perfectly and English, which they learned later on in life. You know, that, that's a reality. I don't have a magic answer for how do you deal with all this. This is why it comes back to we have to work three times as hard mm -hmm. to get that recognition. And, but what's really important to note in this is that you will not be able to just rely on the great experience you had in your home country and the great um, education you have. And even when you're here and you have that job, I don't believe from my own experience that it's good enough to sit back and say, my work will speak for my success. It hasn't worked for me. I thought, oh, you know, as long as I do my work really well, I'll, I'll succeed, I'll become a partner, I'll all be good. It wasn't that way. I had to fight really hard. I had to, like, really shout out about my skills. And it's a, it's a really delicate balance. Like, where do you say, where do you draw the line between um, shouting out your skills so people recognize that you're really a hot commodity versus being considered arrogant and aggressive. And I'm going to tell you now, and nobody can dispute it, and they try to say, yeah, it's all nonsense. The line drawn for a woman for being considered aggressive is much lower than the line drawn for a man at being aggressive. If a man, um, in many situations, is said to just defend his rights and just speak his mind and, you know, be very confident about himself, it's com coming across as reasonable. If the same woman does the exact same thing, the same circumstances, she's aggressive. All my female partners at my firm, we're all deemed aggressive. But we all got this way, and we all became partners. I don't know of any of the women that didn't make partner, 
now being called aggressive. And so I'm just thinking, there's like some coincidence here? I think not. It, it's, it's, it's sad but true that these standards still exist. And then when you factor culture into it, we have so many cultures that come from these backgrounds where to be, sh um, to be quiet and respectful and deferential is something that will be noticed as a positive thing. And it is, but it's not going to get you the top job. It's not going to get you that advancement. My friends who are of Japanese background, they really struggle with it. My friends who are Pakistani like me and my friends who are Jamaican, um, we, we're not shy, so we don't usually have that, that uh, problem. But my friends who are of Japanese background, they said it was so hard because they were raised to be deferential and very polite and not speak too loudly. And, and they said that you know the, the, the success would come to them. The success didn't come to them in the business world. They had to learn how to actually just speak out their accomplishments but not go over that line of becoming arrogant. So that's something I need people to keep in mind too. Know where that line is of not arrogance, but shouting out your experience so that people be and notice you because you can't rely on people just thinking, my work will speak for itself. But um, through all this, all I can say is that, okay, 18 years later, I've relied on my networks. I've relied on thinking that I had to be three times better and working three times harder and and having like, you know, a great support system in terms of my family and my friends and whatever. But it was a really big sacrifice. Um, you know, I, I my similarly situated female partners, we did this analysis because, you know, we all have like this inner angst about, oh, we're these partners, but like what type of life do we have? Out of all the male partners and female partners, every single male partner in my law firm in the downtown Toronto office, they're all married or divorced with children. But they at least did the marriage thing and they all have kids, every single one of them. Out of us, female partners, there's only 17 female partners. Out of the 17 female partners, nine of us never got married. Only eight got married. Of the eight that got married, only four had kids. So. Is How this many a coincidence? Are no. How many are divorced? Pardon me? How many, How many are divorced? Yeah, of the women? Yeah. Oh, um, of the four that are married, uh, four are still married, two are divorced of the two that are single. Yeah. It's, but it's awful. Like, I, I, but it makes you think, wow, nine of us wonder, we wish we even got to divorce. We didn't even get to divorce. <laughs> and so, it's, it's all, it all came at a huge sacrifice at a huge cost and so when you go down this avenue you have to figure out is it worth the cost I don't know I don't know if it was worth the cost how, how the age 17 women where they come from back home oh I'm the only ethnic everyone else is born white Canadian yeah yeah so um, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that statistic, but that's a specific statistic out there. So there isn't any area that's really good. I think really my, my takeaway to everyone now, and I say this to like all the young associates, I'm like, make sure you know what your goal is. Don't get carried away by inertia. If you want to have babies work nine to five and have this nice husband and whatever, being a partner in a law firm is not the job for you. It's just not there. So don't focus on that as like, you know, your next step. And the only way you're going to know that comes back to my networks. If you identify somebody who has the life you want, who has that goal or that profession, um, or those circumstances that you look for, so ask them. If I had that when I was 23 and I had finished law school and I was starting my career, I don't think I would have been practicing on Bay Street for the next 18 years. So, um, yeah. Those are my words of wisdom to you. But I'm happy to answer any questions if people have.